Well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dan Meyer. I'm uh, Editor-in-Chief here at RCR Wireless News. And uh, today we are joined by Mike Murphy, who is the CTO for North America at Nokia, talking a bit about uh, 5G. So, hey, Mike, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks. It's my pleasure, Dan. Very good. Well, I think everybody knows, uh, or at least has heard the term 5G by now. But uh, I guess like, what's, what's Nokia's vision of what 5G uh, is and what it will be, I guess? I think uh, every generation really only does two things. One, it uh, improves on the previous generation, so better, better, faster, bigger, better, faster. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing is expand uh, cellular where it couldn't use be before. And 5G is the same as the previous generations in that regard. 6G and 7G will be the same. And in the case of 5G, that expanding where it couldn't be used before uh, mainly relates to the IoT side by introducing an ultra-reliable and low-latency option in 5G. Uh, but it will have it, uh, enhanced mobile broadband, just like 4G did over 3G. It has a better IoT, just as 4G did over 3G. So those are the things that are expanding on the previous generations. Got it. So just a, pre, just a, it's a constant evolution, basically, of these generations. And like you said, uh, 4G is just the next, next thing for, for 5G is next. And then, like you said, 6G and 7G will be coming down the road as well. But uh, I guess what sort of momentum does, does Nokia see in terms of, of the development of 5G, uh, of the standards, and also in terms of network trials? I think we've heard a lot about some operators uh, working with vendors like yourselves on some network trials. What's been, the, I guess, the progress and momentum there? Well, that, that's a good question because we have a lot of momentum. We have uh, on the Nokia side over 25 MOUs uh, signed, which are in kind of different stages. So some of them are technical discussion with customers, some are lab trials, some are field trials. And, you know, that's not necessarily so new for next generation technology, but perhaps uh, the new part is the, the pace at which things are going. So in 2G, 3G, 4G, you know, generally speaking, trials and deployments started a number of years after the standard was finished. Nationwide deployments, for example, in LT were maybe three years after uh, the standard was finished. In, in 3G, it was longer, maybe about five years. And here we are in 2016, and looking at field trials now and looking at commercial deployments in 2017, which is actually you know a little over two years ahead of the standard. So that's one thing that's significantly different in 5G. Uh, the other thing that I see is that you know, more or less the previous generations were relegated to the big telco players, both on the operator side and the vendor side. And now we see uh, a new, new types of uh, players in the game. So over the tops, uh, cable operators are getting involved in auctions, technical discussions, and then trials. And so that part is new to it as well. And e even on the technology side, you know, centimeter and millimeter wave uh, were uh, used in the military for some time. So suddenly, <laughs> you know, some of our potential suppliers are coming from the military. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting, right? There's a lot, a lot bigger ecosystem, it seems like. And it almost, on the military side of things too, it almost is coming a little bit full circle there because some of the initial 2G technologies, like CDMA, for instance, uh, had some military background as well. And now we're seeing that again with, obviously spectrum is different, but, but uh, yeah, it's kind of almost, a lot of it's coming full circle again. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so in that respect, I think 5G is a little bit different from the previous generations. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And like you said, too, the ecosystem is growing a lot. And, and the timing, that's a good point on the timing, because I thought, just for myself even, I thought for sure that, you know, 4G, that there were, you know, kind of, you know, there was the standards, there were trials, and then there was the launches. And now, that you're right, this new 5G move is, things are gotten kind of mixed up a little bit. And I just thought maybe I was forget, like remembering things differently, but uh, I'm glad you reminded me that, that that was how it was of 4G and even 3G. So it's good to know that I'm not going crazy, at least totally right now. So Yeah, that's right. And even with the pace that we're going at, there's, uh, you know, uh, some companies would like to accelerate it even further. <laughs> yes. So the original standardization for R15 was to be completed in uh, June 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, now there was an agreement to accelerate parts of it, layer one, layer two, into December 2017, and some other parts later. And there's some uh, request to see if we can even accelerate that further. So having uh, more, more parts finished in December 2017. So I don't think we've ever seen that before. So that's new as well. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. Well, I guess, I don't know, one of the things, at least in terms of the trials that have been ongoing, is kind of the, I guess, the use case scenarios. And it seems like, at least initially, uh, some of the operators are talking about, you know, at least their initial deployments being perhaps 
basic things like fixed broadband, which uh, yeah, there, obviously there's, there's a market for that out there. So it seems like people are being a little conservative, at least on that part of things. And I know we're still kind of early in the process, but what's your general view, Nokia's general view, on what the use cases might be for 5G, maybe initially, and then maybe a little bit more down the road as well? Sure. Well, there's, um, there's three big pillars in uh, 5G. One is enhanced mobile broadband, so that's the bigger, better, faster. The other is um, uh, a more uh, support for massive IoT, mm -hmm. meaning more devices per square kilometer, for example. And then there's this ultra-reliable low-latency uh, communications. So each of these three legs um, can introduce different types of use cases. So I think we'll see all, all of those things happening. But in the early days, as, as you well noted, uh, fixed wireless is getting a lot of attention. Um, one thing is, yes, it's true. It actually is slightly easier to do because there's no mobility involved. Mm -hmm. It's also quite easy to understand and do comparative uh, co comparisons against uh, existing tele technologies like fiber to the home. So basically, you're just replacing the fiber with wireless. So uh, in that way, we can uh, assess the, the business cases a bit easier. But then there's also all the exotic things like virtual reality, augmented reality, and connected cars. And, and we're, we're, I say exotic, but you know, some of them will come true certainly to certain degrees. And we're looking at all of those. Yeah, it definitely seems like there's not a, there's not a shortage of, uh, of, of wild ideas when it comes to 5G, what it can do out there. So uh, right. Right, once it actually deploys, we'll see what happens. But yeah, definitely a lot happening out there, that's for sure. Yeah, very good. Well, and obviously you kind of mentioned previous technologies too. I know, you know, obviously LTE and, and 4G LTE is, is pretty broadly deployed now, at least in most advanced countries. Uh, it does seem like that that's going to be uh, probably a big part of what 5G is going to be as well, because it does seem like, again, the, the deployment models for 5G, if they are reliant a lot on the millimeter wave spectrum and centimeter wave spectrum bands, will be somewhat limited in their uh, propagation and their scope. So obviously it does seem like LTE is going to be a big part of this. I guess as you look forward towards these 5G deployments? You know, what's Nokia's view on, on, the, on the importance of, of current technologies being out there and kind of supporting this movement towards 5G? Yeah, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, I refer to the previous generations as replacement technologies. So 3G replaced 2G, 4G replaced 3G, uh, but 5G we don't necessarily see following the same path, at least not for a long time meaning that 5G would coexist uh, in particular with LT and Wi-Fi in a seamless way. And that's, that's built into the standard, it's built in technically, but I think it's also uh, going to happen practically just because of the characteristics of 5G. You know, generally we're thinking of higher frequencies that have uh, more difficult propagation, penetration uh, characteristics. So you will actually need a really strong LT base to have a good 5G network because you know, in general, you don't want to have a, a, a significant drop off when you move from one generation, let's say you're in a 5G cell and then you move over into an LT cell. You want that to be as smooth as possible. And practically speaking, that means that you have a really good 4G network to, uh, to make that happen. So I think uh, 4G is going to be here for a while. And because of that, you need to keep uh, evolving it. And, you know, spec wise and practically, that's what we see happening with customers. Like every generation, the previous one in 3GPP kind of edges closer and closer and starts overlapping with the next one. The same is true with LT. Um, and uh, so I think uh, we'll see, uh, you know, continued deployments for some time. The, the phrase I like to use is, uh, you know, 5G is coming, uh, get your motors running, uh, but there's still a lot of gas in the tank for LT. That is true. I mean, yeah, the, the LT advanced standard itself, I mean, there's still releases to come out for that, which, you know, are, are building on what's out there already. And they seem to provide a lot higher throughputs and, you know, work on latency and, and integrating different small cells and things. This is right. This seems like there's still quite a bit that can happen in terms of uh, the LTE standard. And that's definitely that's a big part of this move towards, towards 5G as well. That's right. And it's not only um, strictly spec or standards based. So for example, you know, we largely see 5G being, for example, a small cells deployment. Mm -hmm. We see the core network be almost completely being uh, cloud-based. So these are things that you need to do in 4G, even before you start thinking about 5G. Likewise, the very famous low latency requirement in 5G. Uh, you know, you can't just wait for, uh, for 5G to come along. You have to start looking at preparing your network in your, in your 4G network. So uh, there's a lot of activity that starts in 4G and the things you do there will actually help your 5G deployments. 
That makes sense. Makes sense. And I guess maybe maybe looking forward a bit, what are some of the bigger challenges you see is still kind of facing the 5G market? I mean, again, I know we talked about standards and things like that. I guess from your point of view, what are maybe some of the bigger short-term and maybe mid-term challenges that are kind of still uh, facing us as as we kind of evolve towards this 5G uh, future? Yeah, well, the the first challenge is we need a spec. (laughs) You know, we have, there's some uh, pre-standard specs out there, but... um, 3GPP is still earliest case for parts of it, uh, end of 17 and more in uh, June 18. So first is completing the standardization process. Uh, Then uh, once you have the standards, you have to develop the products, of course. And where we are now is we we have all the fundamental uh, building blocks. So we have, for example, 5G base station today. We, uh, and it works, it works as required, Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, we need to do a few more steps to further integrate, in particular on the hardware baseline, so that we get a better cost points, we get a better form factor, you know, it's smaller, uh, requires less power, uh, weighs less, etc. So we, we, we have a couple of steps to go there uh, before we make it uh, more practical commercially. And then finally, um, you know, the one nobody likes to talk about is the whole deployment uh, practicalities uh, because with these uh, when you're in the high bands um, you know difficult things start to happen so propagation meaning how far a signal is carried is not as good Uh, penetration through whether it's through foliage or through walls or windows is not as good as in the lower bands Um, and diffraction bending around uh, objects like cars is not as good as in the lower bands all of these are things that you know they're they're there are physical things that you can't change. So what you have to change is the way you're deploying it and perhaps where you're deploying it and how you do all of that. So the, the deployment part um, is very, very challenging. And uh, you know, we're kind of avoiding that question in a moment, but it's going to hit home <laughs> when, uh, when we look at any kind of scale. <laughs> That's true. Well, I guess on the technology side of things, there are enough smart people working on it that that part will get worked out. It always seems to get worked out. Uh, it seems like the people on the technology side, like yourselves, you guys tend to put, a, put aside all of the uh, bickering about competition and stuff and just want to get the things done. Uh, so that part seems to work out, but you're right, the siding aspect uh, will probably be the bigger long-term challenge. And that's going to be you know, bringing in local governments and, and things like that. That's, uh, that's one of those situations that uh, is going to be definitely haunting this market for a while, it seems. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, uh, Tom Wheeler, I've seen him spoke, uh, speak a couple of times on this topic that, and, you know, we agree with him that um, we imagine that the five, 5G uh, cell deployments will be on the order of at least 10 times more than in 4G. And in 4G, we have challenges today with getting sites, with getting backhaul, with getting power. So when you multiply by that 10 or more, uh, you know, it makes for a very uh, challenging situation. So there's going to be a part that comes from technology to help that. Um, for example, we're looking at 5G meshed in band backhaul as one solution uh, for the backhaul part of it. Uh, but there's going to be a regulatory part in there as well. Uh, and cooperative, uh, to be honest with you, you know, cooperative local and uh, local and in the U.S. state and federal governments to help make all of this a bit uh, smoother than it is today. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point there. Well, hey, Mike, we definitely appreciate the great insight. Obviously, uh, we are still early in the process, like we said, but uh, it seems to be moving at a pretty rapid clip. So I know for you guys at Nokia, I'm sure it's a lot of, uh, a lot of long weeks and uh, a lot of long nights of working there. But uh, definitely appreciate you taking the time to kind of touch base on that. And thanks so much for, uh, for enlightening us on the topic. But thanks again for the time today. We appreciate it. Okay. Thanks very much, Dan. All right.